If I look back 35 years of playing with racing cars, the great developments that have happened in Formula One, you haven't seen. That is where the future is. Those are the things that help engineers make better decisions. We should, in you know, three, four, five years time, be able to compete at the front. After decades working at the very top of Formula One, with Benetton, McLaren and Ferrari, and of course, Ayrton Senna, Mika Hakkinen, Michael Schumacher, Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso, Pat Fry is now trying to turn Alpine into championship contenders. In his long F1 career, Pat has experienced the sport's extremes, some soaring highs and some crushing lows and moments which stopped him in his tracks. It is hard to know what to do in that situation, eh? You're chatting with the driver, he goes out and doesn't come back. Seeing mechanics cry is just, yeah, strange. I'm Tom Clarkson, welcome to F1 Beyond the Grid and an intriguing conversation with one of F1's most experienced technical experts. Pat Fry started out at the Benetton team in the late 1980s. He was only 23 years old and Formula One was very different. As he says, back then he was doing jobs which today are done by 50 or 60 people. But year after year, he's worked at the cutting edge of racing technology, helping to develop game-changing inventions like active suspension, McLaren's ingenious extra brake pedal, and later the F-duct, a hole in the McLaren bodywork which gave them a big performance boost back in 2010. He's still at the cutting edge, and he talks about the unseen advances which are driving F1 teams forward today. Pat has got some great stories to tell about the drivers he's worked with, his memories of Mika Hakkinen's terrifying crash during the 1995 season are still fresh and captivating. On the flip side, his tale of the first time he met Michael Schumacher is very funny. Pat's worked with some pretty tough bosses too. McLaren Supremo Ron Dennis comes up a lot in our conversation, as does Ferrari's former chairman Luca Di Montezemolo. Today, Pat is at Alpine and he's working with some of the same people who were at the team when it was called Benetton. As chief technical officer, he's responsible for everything that goes into the building of the car and developing it during the season. As Pat says, that means keeping one eye on the present and the other on the future. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Pat, it is wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you for your time. 35 years of Formula One experience sat right there in front of me. Does it feel like 35 years? Uh, you're making me feel old now. I mean, yes, it does, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I think a Formula One year, they must count as two, really, particularly when you're travelling. It's like doggies, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yes. Yeah. Now, before we get into it all, I did just want to start by talking about these amazing 2022 cars. For you, with your, you know, your engineering head on, does new regs mean new excitement? Um, I think it does always. I mean, it's an opportunity to do something different, isn't it? So you can picture your aerodynamicist who's been there tweaking a floor shape or a body shape, you know, moving things by millimetres, and then you get a complete freedom, a complete change. And, you know, everywhere you look at a set of rules there's opportunities. I mean, I think the hardest job is writing the rules. Because, you know, there's, I mean, I've tried to help out and write a couple in my time, but, you know, you might have five or 10 people writing them. And as soon as you send them to us, you know, there's 30, 40 aerodynamicists in 10 teams. So, you know, there's like 500 people or more, all just trying to uh, interpret them. And it's not what was meant by the rules, it's what they actually say. They've done a good job of trying to really tighten things down, but there are still things there that they weren't expecting. Pat, this raises an interesting question. So these rules came out, what was it, 2019. What is the first thing that happens at a team when you're presented with a new set of rules? Well, I mean, the first thing you do is, well, you, you try and lay out a car of roughly what it means. Or, you know, and now it's all into bo exclusion boxes and you try and get a picture of what it is. But then it, the important thing is to think about what the words say and not what was intended. Because there's so many things. There was, you know, the, 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 they've allow, allowed a wing on the side of the floor. But the way it's written, you can actually move it around and put it underneath the floor. They clearly didn't intend that from the start. But that's what the words say, you know. So it's all about 
exactly what it says and how you interpret it. So look, what about the rate of development? I feel that in the first two tests and then going to, to the first race in Bahrain, we saw huge amount of development on all the cars. When is it going to stop? How different are the cars going to look, let's say, in six months' time? Well, I mean, the car that's in our wind tunnel at the moment is completely different from what's on the track today. There is a massive development. And obviously, you know, we've been sitting on our own, looking at our own little world for the last year, year and a half. And now we've got a view into nine other solutions of that. So there's even more ideas coming along. You know, it's going to take, well, I, I, you know, I think it's going to be like a normal development year. So, you know, the amount of lap time people are going to put on, you're going to put a second or a second and a half on a car this year. And there's some things that you won't be able to do because of the architecture that will change for next year. So, I mean, I think, I mean, ultimately the rules are quite prescriptive and you would think performance will level out, but I don't, don't think that's going to be for a year and a half or two years. Were you surprised by the, the differences that we've seen among all of the cars? Um, not really, no. I mean, we, we've obviously, you know, you, you do a normal tunnel development, you're looking at the shapes of things, you reach a fork in the road, you can go one way or the other, you don't have enough resource to do both. So you go down one route, you know, there's, you know, some of the decisions we've made, I'm sure the right direction, some of them we still question, and we would have gone somewhere different. So it's not surprising there's that much diversity. I guess the interesting thing is how close it looks. I mean, you know, the seven cars in the midfield, from testing, you can't even split them. You know, normally you can work out if you're within a couple of tenths or three tenths, it is so close you can't tell. So, so it's going to change, do you think, from race to race? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, we've yeah. got upgrades planned. I mean, we've got some here. We've got some, you know, coming for race three, race five. You know, it's just uh, uh, the normal development battle started. How important is experience in all of this? I'm not sure if it's experience or a, a mindset, to be honest. So, yes, experience of trying to work out what's important and what's not to make sure you, you know, you put the effort in the right place. Um, but then there's also, it, it's down to, you need that, you know, your, your bigger picture thinkers. So, you know, if, if all you've done is move surfaces by half a millimetre and you iterate to something, you kind of get stuck with doing that. What you actually got to do is step back and look at the overall thing and try and think about the concepts. And that's why, you know, looking in CFD and trying to understand the flow physics, I mean, that's where, that's where you find all the performance these days. So, you know, there's certain people that are great at those overall vision if you like and then there's certain people that are great at sort of you know fine tuning a smaller detail and is this the biggest regulation change that you've experienced in your career which began what was it 1987 back at Benetton yeah I mean it, it's certainly you know one of the biggest I mean I thought it was quite a change when we went narrow track back in whenever that was, 1998, I think that was. That was a reasonable change for everything. Um, it was 2009 when we, you know, the, the 2007 and 2008 cars with all the extra aerodynamic appendages were fantastic. To go from that to something that looked quite, I was going to say boring, but, you know, they're quite limited in what you could do. But then look how we involve those cars, you know. So every time you think you've done a big change, then something new comes along three years later, doesn't it? It keeps on developing. So, I mean, it is a big change. We've made it slightly harder um, by, you know, you know, linking it with a completely new power unit and the layout of the car. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing is how restrictive the rules are and in how many years before it all levels out and everyone ends up, you know, within two-tenths of each other. Your enthusiasm is so infectious, even now. You still love it. Clearly, oh, you still love it. Well, well, of course. I mean, it is one of those yeah. things, isn't it? I mean, it's, you know, 35 years of playing with racing cars. <laughs> it's you one know, way it's, of looking at it, yeah. yeah. How, how has the job changed in 35 years? I started, you know, whatever, green, young, 23-year-old. Yes, we were using wind tunnels, it was, but it was all very empirical on in the, the, like the engineering side of it. I mean, I, I come from a, like an electronic and control systems background, so I'm sort of, sort of quite regimented and everything's got to be understanding and there's got to be a logic behind everything. And that's where, um, you know, one of the early things I was doing was the active cars. As a young person trying to, you know, work out how to engineer a car with, you know, with not a huge amount of vehicle dynamics background, 
you know, I could program it to do whatever I wanted. So it was actually a fantastic way of learning. And you had all these people with, you know, all the experience, it, but it was almost like an empirically learned as such. I do this because of that. And it's like, well, you've got to look at the, you know, the maths behind it. And that's when we started. So, well, actually, uh, if I'm going to run an active car, I need a, a model of the, I need a computer model of the aerodynamics of it. And then once you've got that, I need to model the suspension and what the height and the roll stiffnesses. So all these things, I mean, I guess I, guess, I, guess I turned up with a, the right skill set at the right time to actually get in and, you know, and try and learn. And I say, for me, as a, as a young engineer, having an active car to play with was just absolutely fantastic. What would 23-year-old Pat Fry make of the facilities that you have now at Enstone? I guess I'd be shocked. I mean, I think I was employee number 73 uh, when I started at Benetton, which effectively is Enstone, whatever, 35 years ago. And now, if I started, I'd be, I don't know, employee 800 or something. The world has moved on massively. And it's really the, you know, the attention to detail and the care that is taken on absolutely everything, be it a design, be it the manufacture of something, you know, be it, be it the simulation of it. It's, yeah, it, it, it is just a whole new, completely different world. Even with all the facilities and the tech that you have now, would that 23-year-old Pat have thought the reg's quite restrictive now? I guess if, I, if that was my walking in the door, I think you know th these regs, when you look at them, are about the most complicated set of regulations you've ever seen because they are so prescriptive. So I think if I walked in to start with, I'd be going, I don't actually understand at all these rules are so complicated. In reality, what it's trying to prevent you from doing is all the fancy shapes that we'd really love to be doing. If you were giving advice to young engineers, what have been the biggest lessons you've learnt in your career that would stand someone in good stead now? If I look back, I've just been so lucky that I've actually managed to, to have a job doing something I enjoy. And you've got to enjoy the amount of, you know, whatever your work you want to do, you've got to enjoy it, haven't you? And I've just been, been so lucky. Formula One has changed dramatically in those 35 years, as you keep on reminding me. <laughs> um, you know, it's now, it, it is very, very specialist. So, you know, I, it, I was very fortunate to be, you know, first person in, in Benetton, applying electronics to the car, looking at it as a control system, trying to, you know, model it aerodynamically, model it, you know, uh, you know, dynamically round a track. Now there's 50 or 60 people doing that job and doing it clearly a lot, lot better than I would have done. So, I mean, there are so many uh, different engineering um, disciplines you could be in to have a job in Formula One. I guess one of the things that was sort of stand out to me was you go to work, you do a job. Did you have an okay day or not? I don't know. And, you know, some of the, the electronics design I've done, you know, it would take two or three years before you actually went, yep, that's all working, that's great. Now, as a, you know, my first year race engineering with Martin back in 92, we had a car that was capable of qualifying 10th and maybe finishing 6th. If your car crew managed to get that car to be 6th in qualifying, you know, and 3rd in the race, it's instant satisfaction, isn't it? You can judge yourself every race weekend. And in those days, you obviously qualified on the Friday and the Saturday. So each of those days, you could actually sit back and go, did I do OK or not today? I mean, where else do you get that yeah, opportunity? That immediate feedback. That immediate sense of, well, obviously sometimes failure, but also sometimes elation that you've, you know, you've finished third or you've won the race or whatever. Yeah, the emotional roller coaster of yeah. working for a team, I guess. Yeah. But, well, no, absolutely. And it is a massive roller coaster. Before we move on, I'm going to give you the secret to creating your own spa-like experience at home with the help of our good friends at Harry's. We all know how good a nice clean shave can make you feel. And that's why I trust Harry's, because I get the cleanest, smoothest shave with their kit. If you go to harrys.com slash grid, you can get your hands on one of their trial sets and you'll even get a free shower gel thrown in too. All Harry's products, like their shower gels and face washes, are formulated with 0% sulfates, parabens or dyes, and they're alcohol-free, so it's even kinder to your skin. 
If you look online, they've got a few different scents of shower gel available, like fig and redwood. I've got their stone fragrance, which I really like because it's cool and fresh and just what you need to wake you up in the mornings. In the trial set, you'll get a five blade cartridge complete with precision trimmer, an expertly engineered weighted handle, a travel blade cover and a lovely foaming shave gel. The handle feels great, it has a nice grip, and it's just heavy enough that I don't need to apply pressure while shaving, which helps give me more control over my shave. Make sure you team it up with the foaming gel and your skin will thank you. Support our podcast and give your own shower shave a go by redeeming a free Harry's trial set. All you cover is £3.95 for delivery. Go to harrys.com slash grid to have your set delivered and start a shave plan. Your freebie will be added at checkout. That's harrys.com slash grid. Pat, I want to come on to, to drivers and Martin Brundle and people like that, but which technical advancements have been most enjoyable to work on? You've already mentioned active suspension. That was obviously a big thing. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the active car that I did at um, Benetton, I guess we started that in 1988. You know, that was a fully active car, massively complicated. Yeah, it was too complicated. So we'd take it to a, you know, we'd do five days testing. It, that car would be half a second quicker than the passive car. But if I only had an hour to set it up on a Friday morning, I couldn't do it. It was too complicated. So could you set the height of the car for every metre of the racetrack? Not just the height, you know, the roll stiffness, the ride heights, the, the vertical stiffnesses. When I went to McLaren in, in 93, you know, that, that again was to do the active car there, which was a lot simpler. So it was a simple ride height control system. So it had springs and dampers as your normal car, but we effectively just controlled the ride heights of it and the, the roll stiffness of it. And even that, I could do something different every single metre around the track. I did something like 100 days of testing with Mecca around going around Silverstone and we'd only do 200 or 300 kilometers a day because that's what my brain could handle you know and you'd be there trying to work out what you're going to do for the next run or the next day and there's just so much and it's so you know if the driver says it starts under steering there and stops there I can just lower the front lift the front you know you get onto the straight you would drop it into low drag mode so you lift the front drop the rear of the car to stall the diffuser and our tools were quite basic then what we could make of that now with uh, the 80 people looking at that rather than just me, it would just be phenomenal. I mean, it well, would just be George Russell. George Russell came out during testing saying, we need active suspension back. That would be uh, a good way of solving the porpoising, the bouncing that we've experienced. Um, Do you agree with him? Um, well, well, it would fix that. But I mean, all, basically, you know, going back to that um, 1993 active car, you basically ran it with one front ride height and one rear ride height all the time. So in a corner, it was at those two heights. You, tr you controlled the roll of it so it stayed, the floor stayed flat through those corners, and you just maximised downforce in your development at that one set of ride heights, and you held it there. And then you just stalled the thing when you got onto the straight. So it, you would just end up designing a different car. If you give me that, I will have a completely different aero characteristic to what you've got now. Mm. Now, Mick, I'm interested that you did so much work with the active, uh, with Mick Hakkinen, because he was a guy who had such tremendous feel, didn't he? And did the active take away some of that feel? Did it, was it a bit disconcerting for him? No, I mean, that, that time with Mick was absolutely fantastic because, you know, he, yeah, I guess we were both young. And, um, you know, he would drive a lap, come in, go, right, this is what the car's doing, and then go off and have a have a cup of tea or whatever while I sat there typing away trying to work out what to do next. So it was really a case of him telling me what the car was doing, then me trying to work out how do I take that information and make it quicker. And then, you know, that's why we just work through things logically, you know, but it was literally just, you know, it was something like, it must have been a hundred days we spent there. It was just, it's just quite all fun. quite draining. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds exhausting. Yeah. Now look, other technical developments uh, that I wanted to ask you about, throw some at me as well, if you can think of something, but, Brake steer, that was another McLaren gem, wasn't it? With that, what, three, that, two, two brake pedals, was it? That was, yeah. I mean, uh, in its first guise, that must have been the cheapest performance ever put on a car. It, you know, it was an extra brake pedal, but literally it was one more master cylinder and three metres of line to the back of the car. And when Steve Nichols came up with that, you know, initially we thought, that's a bit weird. You know? 
I think David tried driving it and couldn't get, get used to it. Mika got in and somehow just got his brain around it so that, you know, as you went into the corner, there was an extra pedal for your left foot, which broke the inside wheel at the exit. And as you went on the throttle, you went on the brake at the same time and it just torque steered itself around the corner. So it killed all the understeer. And developing after that, we made it switchable so you could do it on both, both corners. But to start with, it was literally a master cylinder and a line for half a second a lap. So have you found that so often it is the simplest, cheapest solutions? That's always the best way to try and do it. I mean, simple is good. I mean, I say, coming back to the active cars, the complicated one was a lot of fun. And I'm sure, you know, we, we didn't do it credit because of that, our limited simulation resource then. But the simple one just worked. And you could get on and you could use it, you could tune it, the drivers understood it, did the same thing every lap. And that's what, that's what you need. Some of it is consistency in the driver believing, you know, the car's actually going to have the grip when it gets there. Right, another relatively simple one, the F-duct. Well, the, the F-duct, it was, that, it's an interesting uh, project, that one, because well, um, McLaren, we'd, we'd gone all in on that one, so to speak, of that was the rear wing we are going to have on the car, we were going to make it work. We were struggling. And it wasn't until the last test before Melbourne that... I think myself, there was one of the composite guys and an aerodynamicist, we did the night shift and we went, you know, why is it not working? Let's address that bit. And we went through, we actually ended up redesigning at the track, all the ducting through the chassis. And after three nights, we got it working. And it was literally the day before, you know, the last day of the last test was when we actually got that working. Before That's Melbourne. Amazing. Can you remind me, which year was it? Uh, that would have been 2010. But I think of the great developments that have happened in Formula One, you haven't seen. So, you know, some of the best things and the evolution of CFD and the use of CFD, the evolu evolution of mathematical modelling, you know, the development of, you know, proper, you know, dynamic lap sim tools. You don't see any of that at all at the track or talk about it. But, you know, that is where the future is. Those are the things that help engineers make better decisions. So, you know, that in, in reality, there's almost as much interesting stuff happening behind the scenes than, than the, the, you know, the odd development that you, you, you see being brought to the track. And, and you, with your chief technical officer head on of Alpine, you're, I suppose, got half an eye on what the next big development back at the factory is so that you don't get left behind there. Well, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, you're trying to work out what the next ones are, but also at the moment, we're also trying to make sure we can lift our game and, you know, it, Formula One is relatively simple, you know, it, it's, it's three things, you know, it, it, it's good people, you know, it's good methodologies and good tools. And, you know, we need to get all three of those. You need, you need all those people to gel and work together well. But, you know, I need to be looking at what are the right tools, what's the right methodologies so we can make a better car. And a lot of that is not thinking about you know, this week or next week or six months time. It's I need to get there in three years. What are we going to do? How do we get there? And if we think we can get there, how do I do it in two then? As soon as we, we know we can do it in three. Um, you know, so there is that long game that we need to be playing as well as just, you know, can I update the car for next week? Right. People, methodology, tools. What about drivers? Oh, it's the perennial question in Formula One, isn't it? Is it the car or is it the driver? And um, I suppose <laughs> speaking to you, would you say, oh, without the car? But where would you put the importance of the driver? Clearly, it's massively, massively important. It used to be, well, you know, what are the important things? You know, it's, it's aerodynamics, tyres, power and driver. You know, there, were, there used to be four factors. Now, you know, one of them is fixed. Same for everyone. But you know, clearly they play a, you know, a, a, a crucial role, you know, not just in, in driving the car, but also the feedback and also the way they can motivate a team of people and even on a bad day, lift an entire team to actually try even harder next time. Right. Little trip down memory lane now. Um, if I say to you, uh, who's the best driver you've ever worked with? You'd say? Ayrton Senna. Clear cut? Completely clear. I mean, yeah, it, it was an absolute pleasure having the opportunity to work with him, really. That, again, was in 1993 with the active car. Compared to now, our data analysis and all the, all the, you know, the performance analysis that we do, you know, we, we've moved on so far. And he was ahead of his time. He was almost like, a, well, you know, sometimes you thought he was a human data logger almost of, you know, I can remember chatting with him about a problem and he was like, yeah, I know exactly what that was and this is a corner and that's a lap. And you just think, how, do, how does he remember all of that? 
You know, it's you know the the the, the recollection and the skill was just unbelievable. And, and was he? This <laughs> this might sound a slightly silly question, but was he as quick as you were expecting him to be? Uh, absolutely. I mean, there was this one fantastic time at the end of 93 when Mika stood in. Ah, uh, Estoril. Estoril. Yes. And I, I, I have to say I was slightly biased because I was on uh, Mika's side of the garage helping him out there. And um, Mika in his happy, laughy, jokey, carefree way, I think he out-qualified Ayrton by a couple of tenths. And then I think Ayrton had just been taking it easy. And then we got to Suzuka and Mika couldn't get within half a second of him. Ayrton just took another step just up and it was just unbelievable. Just, oomph, there you go, beat that. How interesting that you, you, but you put Senna above Hakkinen, above Schumacher, all these great guys that you've worked with. I would think so, yeah. I think Mika might get upset that I've said that, <laughs> but I'm sure he'll understand. <laughs> right, what about Michael Schumacher? I know you were race engineering Brundle in 92, yeah. but obviously you had a lot to do with Michael. And in those Benetton days, was it clear that Schumacher was destined for great things? Yes. The first time I, I met Michael, Flavio called me into his office in 1991. And in his, I kind of understood from what he was saying, there was a new driver coming along and I had to go and sort a seat fit and I needed to block off all the, all the test bays down at the factory in Godalming where we were working because this new driver was going to turn up. So we blocked off all the test bays and um, Michael turns up. And I hadn't realized that when we blocked all the bays off, we'd blocked off access to the rest of the building and the toilets. So I turned up, I walked from our factory down to the, the it was only like a 200 meter walk. And there, there's Michael um, having a leak on the side of the wall <laughs> as I walk up and it's like, oh, I'm not gonna shake your hand, but nice to meet you. Let's go and sort your seat fit out. So, yes. Welcome to Formula One, Michael. Exactly, yeah, it's not yeah. that glamorous at this point, <laughs> but clearly he went on from there. The following day when we, he actually got in the car, we were testing on the south circuit at Silverstone and Literally, it took him about half... You know, normally, it takes a driver a few laps to get up to speed. For him, it was like half a lap. He came in to the complex just where we used to park the trucks up, absolutely flat out. He was on it. It was just unbelievable. And it's like everyone was like going, wow, you know, this guy is something. Yeah, you're quite taken aback at the time. Uh, yeah, even after, even after one lap, it was impressive. This episode is sponsored by Blue Nile. Celebrate all of life's special moments with fine jewellery from the original online jeweller. It doesn't matter if you're getting ready to pop the question or just looking for a memorable gift for someone special. Fine jewellery as unique as the person you're giving it to at bluenile.com slash UK. Think yourself lucky, because when I was proposing to my wife, I spent a lot of time in and out of the shops trying to find the perfect piece, and I got quite overwhelmed with all the choices I had to make. Blue Nile takes the stress out of shopping for you. Their simple online tools let you choose the diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as setting the style. Blue Nile's bench jewelers will then build the perfect engagement ring. And if you're struggling to choose a piece of fine jewellery, their dedicated jewellery experts are on hand 24-7, available via phone or online chat to help you find a memorable gift at every budget. Make your moment sparkle with jewellery from bluenile.com slash UK. And here's a special offer for F1 Beyond the Grid listeners in the UK. £50 off £500. This podcast exclusive runs until Mother's Day in the UK. That's Sunday the 27th of March, so get in quick. It's valid on gifts for mum and also includes engagement jewellery. Use the code GRID50. That's code GRID, G-R-I-D, 50. Your order will be insured, it'll be delivered for free, and it'll arrive in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go to bluenile.com slash UK today. Let's talk Hakkinen. Senna is, you say, the driver that really stands out above everyone else. But Mika had great qualities as well, didn't he? I mean, Mika on his day surely was one of the fastest we've ever seen. No, I think at that time, definitely so, yeah. I say, I think he did catch out and unawares in uh, Estoril that year. But yeah, I mean, if you look at the, yeah, the next couple of years after that, it was outstanding, wasn't he? 
Can I ask you about a period that must have been very hard for you and for everyone at McLaren? Adelaide 95, you were race engineering maker and he had that horrific accident. Mika Hakkinen, that looks unpleasant. There's a big, big shunt. Mika Hakkinen has gone sideways heavily into the tower wall. And this may well see a red flag because that car is in a precarious position. The medical unit straight on to the scene. And that is very, very quick indeed. You're going through there in, well, fourth gear, 180 to 200 kilometers per hour. The car would have scrubbed off very little speed because it's hipped, hopped and skipped and gone sideways heavily into that tower wall. Well, we don't know why that just the car came so quickly into sight. Even the camera unable to keep up with it, it flew. That was an impact, certainly in excess of 100 miles an hour. He had to have a, an emergency tracheotomy uh, on the track, didn't he? What are your memories of that whole horrible weekend? Yeah, I mean, it is, it is hard. I mean, it, to know what to do in that situation, eh? You're chatting with the driver, he goes out and doesn't come back. Yeah, it must have been two or three months before I actually spoke to him from that point. You know, he was in an induced coma in hospital for, for many, many weeks after that. So, yeah, I mean, and it's hard. And everyone was just like, you know, seeing mechanics cry is just, yeah, strange. Was that the first time something like that had happened to you in your career? Uh, certainly, yeah. No, yeah. absolutely. Or did you feel, although one step removed, did you feel... Uh, similar when, when Senna had his crash at, at Imola the year before? Yeah, I mean, again, that was one of those things where you sit there looking at the screen and you just think, oh, my God, how do you walk out of that? But, you know, then someone's shouting in your ear, there's a restart, the car's here, car's to the grid, and you've almost got, it's got to, you know, it's hard to say, but, you know, you've got to go and get on with your job. I mean, fortunately, obviously, you know, safety has moved on massively now, which is just, just great. When Hakkinen got back into a racing car for the first time, I think it was like, was it late January, maybe early February of 1996 at Paul Ricard? Were you at that test? Uh, yes. What was the mood in the garage? Was there a sense of euphoria to see him back doing what he does? Um, well, I mean, it's, it, it was, you know, it was great to have him back, but it was also sort of all very low key just to try and, you know, build up, you know, build up slowly. Did he build up slowly? Or being Mika, did he just um, nail it? I, I think we, he built up slowly, I think. Do you think that that crash took anything away from Mika as a driver? I don't think he was any slower. I mean, normally, after something like that, people slow up. Look at him through 98, 99, 2000. He certainly hadn't lost any of his pace, had he? No, certainly not. And now, what about Alonso? I feel that he's the guy you've worked with probably more than anyone else. It's, have there been four different instances now that you've worked with Fernando? So That's right, yeah. I mean, I've worked with Fernando, I think, eight years in the last 14, or maybe it's 15 now. Yeah, so, so two uh, stints at McLaren. Two stints at McLaren. Ferrari and, of course, now yeah. at Alpine. What stands out about him, first of all? I mean, I think the most standout thing is the level of focus and commitment. It is just 100%. Great, and it just pushes everyone along. How has he evolved as a driver during the time you've worked with him? He's always been absolutely super fast. The way he approached last year and dealt with it, you know, played him, not played himself in slowly sounds wrong, but, you know, he, he admitted he was going to take a little while to get up to speed. You know, in Imola, you know, he came up to us after qualifying and went, there's nothing wrong with the car. It was me. That's why we are where we are. Knuckles down, you know, two races later, he's back out qualifying and, you know, doing a fantastic job. You know, it is just, I mean, he's just relentless, which is what you need. The way he managed to motivate everyone in the garage last year, even in a down moment, he managed to lift everyone and, and move the team forward. How many drivers in your career have fessed up like that and said, it's me, not the car? I mean, a few have said it to me. Oh, they have but, said it. I thought none of. I thought you were going no, to say none been, of them. There's, there's been a few, but I mean, that that must take quite a lot, mustn't it? Really, oh, that wasn't my best day. Let's move on. Can I take you back to 2007? You were at McLaren. 
Uh, it was Fernando and Lewis Hamilton, and it all went spectacularly wrong. Do you think if they were partnered now, it would have gone wrong? Do you think they would have been able to keep a lid on it? Or was it always destined to go wrong? I think I'd quite like to see it happen, to be honest. Now, have them now, together. Now, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's an impossible question to answer. If you put two top drivers in the same team, that's always going to give the management some, some hard work, isn't it? Yeah. So if, if Fernando is relentless, would you say the same about Lewis? Does he have those same character traits? Well, I think that they're both massively focused, aren't they? You need that sort of single focus to get where they are and do what they do. How unpleasant did it get between them? Or do you actually think there has always been the utmost respect? Because I felt last year with Lewis and Max, a lot of people were sort of playing up this rivalry when I felt they never lost the respect for each other, come what may. Was it the same with, with Fernando and, and Lewis, do you think? I'm not sure. I mean, I think they always respect each other on track, don't they? Uh, what they think about off track is for them to decide. Were you aware that Hamilton was as good as he was at the start of that year? Because it seems to me that's sort of the fundamental issue with the whole thing is no one quite expected Lewis to be as good as he was. Well, no, I mean, I think you could see from the start of that year, he was massively quick. And by mid-season, you know, if you said at that point, who's going to out-qualify who, I expect, you know, the money would have been on Lewis out-qualifying Fernando. But if you then ask that question for who's going to out-race the other one, all the money would have been on Fernando. I guess it's that, you know, brave young person willing to push it slightly further maybe for the qualifying, I don't know. But that's the way it would have separated out back then and obviously now Lewis has lifted the racing game massively from from where he was in um, in 2007. So you've spent more time at McLaren than anywhere else is that where you've been happiest do you think? To be honest I've been happy at all the teams I've worked for um, they've all been different experiences to be honest I mean going to Ferrari living in Italy when I moved to Italy, my children were five and three. It was a fantastic experience for them. It's a bit like managing the, the national football team out there, you know, being technical director of Ferrari. I mean, it's got massive pressure, but it's a massive amount of fun. It was a really enjoyable, you know, four years I had out there doing that. I mean, it, even, even now, you know, I've come back to almost where I started 35 years ago. You know, it is, it is like I say, it's the same team. Clearly, it's been through a few name changes. I think there's still four people left at the factory. I, mean, I might have spent 35 years away. They've been there all the way through. So credit to those four, really. <laughs> Fernando said last year that he started working with some of the sons of the people he was with back in the early 2000s. But look, let's talk a little bit more about Ferrari. You know how drivers say you can't say no to Ferrari. Why wouldn't you want to be a Ferrari driver? Is it the same for engineers? Was it always an itch that you wanted to scratch? With, with all the travelling around you know, the world that I've done, the one place that I would have liked to have gone to live was Italy. Having the opportunity to work for Ferrari, you know, live in Italy, I mean, you've got to tick that one off your sort of Formula One CV, haven't you? I have to say it wasn't what I expected when I got there. A lot of the stuff that they were doing, I mean, there's huge passion and huge drive... But again, they had been lacking that longer term vision of what, you know, you're not going to fix a car now, you need to fix it. You need to put the system in place to, you know, in three years time to build a better car. And, you know, they, they, they'd sort of swung into this very short term um, view of developing because of the immense pressure. You know, you have to perform in Italy. I mean, it is... It so is, it is real. This, this pressure is real. Oh, no, absolutely. And it's, right. you know, I, I guess... Ron started me off with the um, it's first or nothing. And that was exactly the same at Ferrari. You know, you celebrated a win, second was nothing. You know, that's all you were there to do was win. Has Ron ever spoken to you again since leaving McLaren to go to Ferrari, by the way? Uh, yes, he has, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Consider yourself <No>. lucky. <laughs> Did the fact that you arrived at Ferrari in 2010 and then Alonso had that very unfortunate end to that year where, of course, he lost at the last race. 
Did that sort of set this short-termism in motion? Because they thought Alonso was going to deliver the title that year. It didn't happen. So we had to deliver it in 2011. We had to deliver it in 12. Well, I think that the short-termism, or whatever the right expression is, um, had started much before then. So a lot of their tools by uh, standards I've been used to were five or ten years out of date. So, you know, there was a lot of stuff that needed to be improved to be able to make a better car. I mean, I must admit, 2010 doesn't stick in my mind. I'm more focused on, was it 2012 we lost the championship? I think it was three points that year. So, um, yes, we came close, but not close enough. It's ridiculous how close you guys got. You know, what is a long... It's another, is it eight points? And Alonso would be a five-time yeah. world champion? Yeah. How much do you get affected by those disappointments? I mean, my, my job there is to drive the team forward. We, we've got to look at the longer term developments, but also keep the people motivated on the short term. We needed to, you know, to change quite a lot of the ways we, we worked. But, you know, you've also got to try and keep those people motivated. You know, if you think there's pressure in a Formula One team, just, it, just another level a lot of it is, you know, those people couldn't work harder. What we needed to do was give them the tools to be able to work smarter. And, you know, and that's really what was needed there. I mean, there was, you couldn't fault anyone for effort, let's say. Having worked for Ferrari, has it given you a greater understanding of Formula One? Has it sort of given more perspective? I think it's been interesting working for a, you know, a number of teams. You know, McLaren have their certain way of working. Ferrari have theirs. You know, the brief spell I did consulting at Manor. Again, that was like completely opposite end of the grid, but, uh, you know, a different set of problems. But it all makes you, you know, you're all trying to achieve the same goal, but in different ways. You know, one's, one might be spending 50 million, one's spending 400. You know, it's just, you know, all trying to <laughs> achieve the same thing. And do you feel the history of that place? Just walking around the building, seeing the pictures on the wall, going into the museum, seeing the old cars... Did you get caught up in, in the, the mystery of it all? I think that the whole experience, you know, that the, the four and a half years that I was there was just, it was just a pleasure, to be honest. That you say the place is steeped in history, but you, know, you, you could walk from our office, in five minutes you could be over at the Fiorano track. There was a, there was a fantastic old picture on the side of the uh, design office wall, where, you know, which I think was Gilles Villeneuve with a bottle of Lambrisco, talking with the, the president over something and it's just there it was you know it was just a completely different experience to anywhere else really have you been into enzo's office at fiorano he's got is there's the cottage in the middle it, isn't exactly it? yeah we used to have meetings over there oh did you yes yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, off to the side of it yes but his office is all there it's good this podcast is sponsored by better help online therapy you don't need to work in a high-speed sport like Formula One to understand the impact stress and pressure can have on our mental health. When you're trying so hard to juggle work, relationships with your colleagues, family and your friends, it's no wonder that so many of us forget to look after ourselves. If we've learned anything about F1 drivers so far, it's that they know that to perform at their best and to be a good teammate, they need to look after themselves first and foremost. That's why many drivers work with psychologists and therapists. This month, BetterHelp wants to remind you to do the same, to take care of your most important relationship, the one that you have with yourself. Put yourself first for once in any way that makes you feel good, whether that's starting a new hobby, going to the gym, or even trying therapy to help you clear your head. For me, it's running or cycling. They help me feel happier and calmer when things are stressful. But I know that sometimes the only thing that will help is talking through problems. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why more than 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and F1 Beyond the Grid listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash grid. That's BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R, 
H-E-L-P dot com slash grid. While we're talking bosses, you've thrown a few names around and I did just want to ask you about the merits of, I mean, let's start with Flavio, Flavio Briatori. He was in charge at, at Benetton when you were there. And he was pretty wet behind the ears then as well, wasn't he? He really no. was new to Formula One. Yeah, when he started, yes. So when did, that must have been 1990, I would have thought. Yeah, a tiny bit before time. maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How was he to work with, you know, as, a, as an engineer, did you feel he understood your needs and requirements? I wouldn't say he understood our needs and requirements. I mean, he gave us a space to work. And, I mean, there, there was this one... Yeah, well, I, I'll say it was great. It wasn't, wasn't funny at the time. But, you know, there was, it's how different people react. So we're in Canada. I was engineering Martin. And in qualifying, I ran the car out of fuel. And it, the car rolled to a stop about 50 metres before the pit entry. Because you know, you're trying to obviously save every last little gram you can. And, you know, you're feeling like the worst person in the world. That was one of my, obviously, down days and how well did I do that day. And um, Tom Walkinshaw jumped off the pit wall and started shouting at Ross and your engineers are you know, just taking too much risk or whatever. Flavio walked off the pit wall, you know, gave me a hundred dollar bill and said, fill it up next time, Pat. But in reality, that's him going, I know you feel really bad and I know if I make this, you, you will not, never do that again. And that was just the way, you know, that was his way. What a was, great he story. got his point over, but without shouting. <laughs> What a great story. That actually says an awful lot about Flavio, doesn't it? Yeah. Let's move on to Ron. Very, very different kettle of fish. Yeah. But ran a great racing team. Well, no, absolutely. I mean, it was, again, McLaren in the sort of, whatever, the early 90s, yeah, it was, again, just what a, what a place to work in, really. I, I guess, you know, my wife would be a little bit upset because I, I think I've picked up some of my OCD and tidiness Everything has to be in line at home now, so I'm sure she's upset about it. But, you know, That's that was wrong. Yeah. yeah, but then if you actually looked at the McLaren garage at those days, you know, there was this smart-looking thing. If you want a sponsor, look what he, what he would provide. You go next door and there's, you know, it was just night and day different, wasn't it? I know everyone's now come up to that level and, and surpassed it, but that was really ahead of its time, really, wasn't it, on that side of it? And the MTC itself was ahead of its time. You were there during the, the period of, of pre and post MTC. How did the MTC change your sort of working practices? On the engineering side of things, not massively, really. I mean, it was nice having, you know, the aerodynamicists in the same building as all the, all the designers. And, you know, it, it's a lot easier if you can just walk from one end of an office, you know, at Ferrari, if I wanted to talk to an aerodynamicist I had to walk a kilometre through the car plant to, you know, to the wind tunnel that was at the complete the other end of the site MTC was a nice place to work and then the wind tunnel that we were using at the time was right next to us so again you know all that part of it worked really well you know, and, until we realised at some point that we'd outgrown the wind tunnel which they're sorting now aren't they would you say Ron understood what the engineers needed I think so, yes. I mean, certainly in the sort of early, late 90s and, you know, early 2000s, and we, we, we had everything that we needed. If anything, I think, you know, we, we spent in the, the early 2000s, we spent too much time doing fun R&D projects and not concentrating on the race car. And it was only in sort of 2006 where we said, right, actually, I'm going to design a car using all these great tools. You know, we'd invented a simulator, we were leading that technology. We had the best simulation technology in the world. Well, let's actually use that to make a car. And from that, and applying all that knowledge and, that we built up, we then applied it to actually making a car. And from that came the 2007 and the 2008 car. Got it. And, and 2.5 and 2.6 were devastatingly quick as well, weren't they? But yeah. perhaps a little bit fragile. Yeah. If I say to you MP418... That was special. <laughs> For people who don't know, that's the McLaren that never raced. Was it a mad project? How good was that car? That car was awful. <laughs> it, it was a classic thing of pushing absolutely everything too far. And, you know, in, in the, the drive to try and push absolutely everything to the edge, not just one thing was over the edge, everything was over the edge. Every time that car came back into the pits, it was on fire. 
you know, there was like a £50,000 fire extinguisher bill just for putting a car out from a couple of winter tests. It was constant. Not our finest moment, shall we say. <laughs> but if you look at that, you know, we had the 17D that was racing that year. You know, we nearly won the championship with that car and we didn't actually put it back in the wind tunnel until sort of June, July time. You know, so we started, you know, that, the 18 was going to come in at race five or something. So even through that complete disaster you were still cracking on and doing a reasonable job does make you wonder doesn't it had you put the the 17d back in the wind tunnel earlier what might have happened doesn't it that's one of those what (laughs) might have been moments (laughs) isn't it there is one other team boss i wanted to ask you about stefano dominicali he's now of course uh, the boss of formula one he was in charge at ferrari at the time very charismatic leader what about his understanding of what you needed in the engineering department? Yeah, I mean, I think Stefano, again, fully supported all the engineering requirements that we needed. And the one good thing about Ferrari was if it was a long term investment, like I think I've got a problem with the wind tunnel, I want to saw the middle out of it and fix it. You know, a lot of people go and start panicking. It was like, well, OK. What's needed, we'll find the funding, let's get on to do it. So, you know, there was that total support commitment from him, from Luca de Montezemolo. You know, if you told him what you needed, it would happen. Did Stefano shelter you from some of that pressure and the politics that we've already touched on? Um, I think it's difficult with um, Luca for anyone to, to shelter you from him, shall we say. I guess John Todd was the most successful one years earlier at removing the pressure off the engineers to allow them sort of room to to move if you like but that's all part of ferrari you know if it wasn't for that pressure it wouldn't be the same would montezemolo just come into your office and say what's going on with the car there's there's been a few table banging moments <laughs> really? i have to say really? oh, okay. no absolutely but he was that all... involved yeah. well, he, well he was he was that um dramatic shall we say but it, it's all, you know, it, it, it's all built on a passion for wanting to make the place better. You know, but the thing is, it's a case of the reason it's not better is because of the long-term thinking. It's not been there for the last 10 years. So that's what you, you know, you, you need to lift the standard of the entire, you know, the, the process and the methodologies behind making a car. That's where they were lacking, really. So let's bring it on to the current. In your role as Chief Technical Officer of Alpine, I'm very much sensing as a result of this conversation that you are looking many years ahead. I mean, I think you have to be. You know, in 2006, for me, it was great because all I had to do was thinking about the 2007 car. I didn't have to worry about managing anyone. It was just, Chief Engineer, what's going to be there? Let's make sure I get the best engine, best chassis package. And it's a very simple program on a defined timescale. Now, it's, as you say, it's like, yes, I need an eye on what's going on this year and how to do it. But what's actually important is making sure I can give people, you know, better tools and that in two, three years time. Because, you know, a lot of these things, it, it, that's, you, you need to think that far forward to actually, you know, move the place forward long term. But do you have everything you need now, uh, at Enstone in particular, to, to win races and get where you want to go short term? Well, this year will be challenging, as you could see. I mean, there's still, even though there's a cost cap, there's a lot of good teams out there with a lot of experience. And back to my favourite three things, so they're better armed in all of those than me. And, you know, we've got a different set of problems. We're, coming, we're growing up to the cost cap. While I'm growing that, I need to be investing in all the tools and methodologies. And while I'm doing that, I'm not spending that money on car development. But that's trying to find that right balance for doing as much as we can this year while still having an eye on the long game. So Laurent Rossi, the boss of Alpine, has talked about P5 in the championship this year. Now, you being a competitive man, would you be satisfied with that? Ultimately, no. You know, I still want to be P1 in five or six years. I guess that's Ron doing that to me and Ferrari doing that to me. P5, you know, is where we were this year. Who knows where things are going to be? It is a complete sort of turn up of the books with these rules. But ultimately, we should, in, you know, three, four, five years' time, be able to compete at the front. 
and that's what the goal is, isn't it? It's about, I'm, I'm here to, you know, to build a team that's going to make the car. I think that is the perfect place to end this, Pat. Good luck with all of that. Thank you very much for your time. It has been wonderful to have you on the show and great to chat. Thank you very much indeed. Wouldn't it be great to see Alpine up there winning races this year? The team has what it needs to succeed, and as Pat says, the car's development path is going to be steep. I can't wait to see what the next iterations of the car look like. And while I enjoyed hearing Pat talk about the new cars, it was wonderful to hear some of his stories from the last 35 years, both technical and human. I mean, what a way to meet Michael Schumacher. And that Flavio story after the qualifying drama in Montreal had me in creases. Pat, many thanks for your time. It was great to chat and good luck with the season ahead. Before we move on, I wanted to share some of your comments about last week's episode with Carlos Sainz. The Spaniard has a lot of fans, doesn't he? Holly sent this in. I loved your chat with Carlos. He offers such a fresh and honest perspective into Formula One. I can't wait to see what he can achieve with Ferrari this year. And I'm so looking forward to seeing all the teams at the Australian Grand Prix in a couple of weeks. Well, thanks for the note, Holly. And I can't wait to head down under for the race as well. And I think Carlos is going to be right up there at Albert Park. Next message, let's go to Rahul Aurora, who said this. Season five with number 55. What a great start to the new season. Great insights from Carlos, especially how he describes that he's not a smooth operator. He surely is ready for the championship. All the very best for this season, Carlos. Well, who doesn't like the number five, Rahul? And thanks for the note. Great to hear from you. Uh, let's do one more message. How about this from Tony Chi, who says... Love the latest conversation with Carlos. Made so much sense and it has motivated me to go to the gym in the morning. Well, me too, Tommy. My body doesn't know what's happening to it right now. And that's thanks to Carlos Sainz. We'll leave it there for now. We've got some great guests lined up in the next few episodes. And to make sure you don't miss them, follow the podcast or turn on notifications. Thanks for listening, everybody. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 and Audio Boom Studios.